Hi, I'm Loretta Bush, President and CEO for Authority Health. March is National Nutrition Month. Now, nutrition is a critical part of health and development. There's a few things that we know about nutrition. Actually, there's a lot that we know about nutrition, but we're gonna focus on young people for just a moment. So nutrition is related to improve infant health, child health, maternal health. It also builds a stronger immune system. It leads to safer pregnancies and childbirth. Here's some other good news. It also reduces the likelihood of chronic diseases, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and it promotes longevity. All of these things are just such great things that we all should strive for, and it all starts with great nutrition. Now those are just a few of the reasons why we should want to prove, uh, improve our nutrition. Now I have a special guest here with me today who's going to help for us to explore the importance of food and nutrition, especially for youth. I have with me Chef Kevin Frank. He is the Assistant Director of the Office of School Nutrition for the Detroit Public Schools Community District. He is a graduate of Schoolcraft Culinary Arts Program and he has his bachelor's and his master's degree in business. Thank you for joining me, Chef Frank. Thank you for having me. So let's start off by just talking about what you're doing there with the Detroit Public Schools, what you're doing to help to promote good nutrition. So I've been with, um, with DPSCD for nine years, almost 10 since um, September 2012. And in my time there, I've done, I've made lots of changes to the menu. Um, we've moved to a speed scratch preparation method from, from Heat and Serve, which basically means we take minimally processed proteins and add fresh vegetables, um, different things to that to them to make our meals as opposed to just buying meat sauce or buying chili and heating it up. And I think um, that allows us to make sure that we know exactly what's going into the meals as far as, any, as um, you know, our the preservatives or any any artificial colors or flavors that would be going into the meals from those heat and serve foods, we've kind of eliminated those. So that's what they're calling scratch cooking. Is that what you're talking about there? Yeah. Well, yes and no. So uh, uh, when I say speed scratch, it's not there's there's levels to scratch cooking, right? So there's speed scratch, is where we, which is where we are, and then there's full scratch. Full scratch involves bringing in raw protein, so raw chicken, raw ground beef, things of that nature. We haven't gotten to that point yet. I would love to at some point, okay. but we still have some, some infrastructure investment that, and training that needs to happen before we can get there. Okay, so, so you're steps. at speed scratch, hoping to get to full scratch kitchen, uh, exactly. cooking, but you've moved away from kind of the pre-packaged and exactly. things like that. Well, that, that's exciting. Now, also, you talked about, I believe, bringing more fresh fruits and vegetables, and have you designed a menu that kind of follows the seasons, like autumn cooking, winter cooking, spring cooking? Talk to us about what that means. So I am... Um, one of the, another change that I made pretty early on in, in our um, or in my, my work with DPSCD is I went to a cycle menu. We have three different cycles per, um, per year. We have autumn, winter, and spring, which like you said, takes advantage of what's locally available fresh um, for, for our menuing purposes. So autumn, because obviously we know in Michigan that's like right during the harvest season, that's when we see all of our, all of our fresh vegetables, anything from green beans to yams, pumpkins, pretty much anything that we can find fresh locally from Michigan is what's menued. In winter it gets a little bit difficult because yeah. you know cer certain things don't really hold very well. We have lots of fresh apples from, from Michigan in winter, but more often than not that's when we see um, vegetables coming in from California be because of the fact, like I said, that, that a lot of things don't hold. And then moving back into spring, we start to see some of those earlier, those earlier harvested vegetables coming back onto the menu. So actually, um, it's funny that you, that you mentioned this being Nutrition Month in March. March is when our spring cycle starts, so that's when we're going to start, well, later in March, more toward April, is when we're going to start seeing some of those, those fresh Michigan vegetables coming back on the, uh, onto our menu. Okay. Is there a benefit of eating locally? It seems like I remember hearing something about that, that you should eat things that are low grown locally and things like, is there a real benefit to eating things that are local? 
So I, th I think there are multiple benefits to it. Um, first off, we'll, we'll take financially, we, we give back to the, to the local economy, right? So there's, um, there's a program going on right now with MDE called 10 cents a meal, which means that every meal we serve locally, locally grown produce, we get an extra 10 cent. It's a matching grant program. Yes. So um, the, financial, the financial implications, I, I think, can't be overlooked, especially given that we have so many local growers right here in the city of Detroit. Like, realistically, I have people growing fresh fruit and fresh vegetables in my backyard. I think I owe it to, to the community to, to give back. And if I can potentially menu those foods that are being grown, grown in my backyard to our students, why would I not? That so makes that, a lot of sense, you that, know. And here's the thing, you know, um, economics are important. Mm -hmm. You know, when you uh, look at things, you know, there's uh, many times it ties back to finances and everything. And if we want to have people continuing to grow fresh fruits and vegetables, we need to support them in doing that. That exactly. just makes a lot of sense, yeah. Let's talk about young people. Okay. And many times folks say that it's a challenge to get um, people in general and kids specifically to eat healthy. How do you do it? Trial and error, to, to be completely honest with you. And it, it, it is a challenge. I know my own children, they, they rebel against pretty much anything that even looks remotely healthy. But I think that it's, it's um, if I, could, if I could borrow a, borrow a phrase from one of the people I work with at the CIA, the, the Culinary Institute of America, not the other one. Oh, when you said the CIA, <laughs> I was like, okay, wait a minute, Chef. Wait, this is, right. you got a whole nother life going on here. No, not, I, I All wish. Right. But no. So I, I, I partnered with the, uh, the Culinary Institute of America on the Healthy Kids Collaborative, and one of, um, one of the, the sayings there is make the, the, the healthy choice the good choice, or make the good choice the healthy choice. We don't necessarily have to make food that is healthy unattractive or unappealing or bad tasting. Yeah. So it's, it's really about a paradigm shift and I, and I think that that's where, that's where the, the trial and error comes in. Like one of the things that we tried um, a couple of years ago was bringing in falafel to the district. You know, falafel is made, is made with chickpeas. It, um, the product itself wasn't, wasn't bad, but it was not really implemented properly. And, I th and that's one of, the, one of the things that I'm learning. What we have to do is take what our students know take what the community knows and kind of, for lack of a better term, kick it up. Okay. So, uh, and I think in, do, in doing that, that's how we, that's gonna be the avenue that we, that we use to encourage healthy eating. Okay, so what did you learn from that? When you say kick it up, what would you have done differently? Specifically with the falafel? Yeah. Um, I, it, it was almost ham-fisted, and, I, and I, I, I hate to say that because I have a, an immense respect, amount of respect for the people who, um, who came up with the idea for doing this one, but it was, placed on the menu without, without any real, I don't want to say real research, but it was placed on the menu without any market research, specifically to, to our students. So there was like a lot of rebelling because it went from never having seen it before to being served all across the district as one of two different, two different entrees being offered. And one of the other things that I did now is I increased our entree count um, in our high schools from five to 17 on a good day. When, when everything is, is working correctly, and we know that right now in the pandemic, that's not necessarily the case, but right. on a great day, when everything works perfectly, we'll have 17 entrees in our, um, in our high school so that everybody who is there can you know, have, a choice, have a choice of what they want. Um, like I said, specifically with, with the falafel, I think that it was too much too quick. Too much too quick. I tell you, and you can tell me if you, uh, wh what you think of this I idea. In our home, when we had children, you know, growing up, our philosophy was try it three times before you know you don't like it. Right. Yeah, now if you just absolutely that first time, you know, you just wanted to like <laughs> run off the house screaming, but try it three times before you're sure you're don't, you don't like it. And so that's how we kind of introduced things. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's actually similar, similar to the way that I do it now. We have um, what's called a menu advisory council. It's comprised of just v different various stakeholders, parents, teachers, students, our staff. And what we do with that menu advisory council is we do like small product testings first in front of that council if it passes muster at the council. Then we do isolated tests in different corners of the city because the reality of the situation is the city's kind of segregated still. Yeah. So what works in Southwest may not work in Midtown and even if it works in Southwest and Midtown, it may not work in, in the Northeast side. So we yeah. do tests all around the city um, just to make sure that whatever the product is will be well received all around the city and then if it passes muster on those tests, that's when it get 
it gets put on the menu at large, like across the entire district. Okay, and so um, does your menu then vary from area to area, or is your menu standard? Well, you did say you have like 17 different choices, so it's pretty standard. Right. Okay. Yeah, All it's right. pretty standard. But, um, but so for me, menuing is a, is a, is a matter of equity. Right, I want to make sure that our menu represents the demographic makeup of the district, so I want to make sure that there's always something for everyone on the menu. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's always going to be um, you know, Latinx flavors or Middle Eastern flavors on the menu every day, but they will be on the menu at certain points throughout the week. At and that's point. done district-wide with, with, with the recognition that not everybody's going to want that, so there's always going to be an, an alternative for you know, something else. That sounds great. So we talked about that March is National uh, Nutrition Month, and this year the theme is a world of flavors. Now I know that last summer you participated in a panel where they talked about uh, the, the spice challenge, is that correct? And uh, address the, like the challenge of introducing spices to students and all of that. So let's talk about how you spiced up uh, the menu in the city of Detroit. So that, um, that actually came also from, it was, it, was, it was twofold. It was a matter of equity and making sure that we, that we were serving dishes that were ethnically respectful and, and authentic, but also because of, um, because of the current nutritional regulations and, and w the way that the nutritional regs are moving in the future to, toward cutting down sodium. We season everything with salt normally, yeah. right? And, and especially in the restaurant industry and, and honestly at home. That's not really something that we can do in schools, but just because we can't use salt doesn't mean we can't enhance flavor. So that's kind of where the, um, the idea of using different spices, excuse me, like turmeric, garlic, um, ginger, cardamom, things of that nature came, came in. And um, it's funny that you mentioned the, the spice challenge. That was something that I did at our state um, school nutrition conference, and it's something that the national conference has asked us to do this summer. So I'll be doing the same thing again, hopefully anyway, this summer in July in Orlando. Well, that's great. So, you know, I think that that's something, if you can, let, let's just stay on that a little bit more because uh, I really want our listeners to really uh, I want that to resonate with them because most of us have been taught to season food with salt and pepper and then seasoned salt yeah, and then spicy salt and Lowry seasoned salt and then salty salt and special salt right. and garlic salt and then some more salt and then put salt on the table and then wonder why we have hypertension and, and all of that and you know and then certain uh, ethnic groups are already, you know, salt sensitive uh, to begin with, just from, you know, from culture and everything. So, um, but we also know that we want food to taste good mm -hmm. and everything. So this whole thing about, you know, uh, using different kinds of spices. So I want you to mention a few of those spices again. Okay. Maybe a little bit slower this time yeah, so people can, uh, you do talk a little bit fast, that's all right. <laughs> You talk fast and I talk loud, so we're a good team, right? It works. It works. It, it's working. So, um, mention the spices again that people can use so that their foods can taste good. And I think that many of these foods you probably can get. I mean, these spices you can get from the local grocery store, right? They no, don't necessarily about. have to go any place special. So, mention a few of these spices again. Okay, so my favorites. Um, to, to enhance flavor without adding salt, um, garlic is, is a staple. Um, a lot of people like to use onion powder. Personally, I like to use sauteed onions because, so salt and, and sodium, um, they affect what are called the umami flavor receptors on the, on the tongue. They, it, umami is that like salty, savory flavor that, that, um, that is, what, is what you're picking up. You can kind of mimic that flavor by sauteing certain, certain vegetables. Onions is one of them. Uh, mushrooms is, is a great way to add, okay. um, to add that umami flavor. So you get that salty taste without, without the added sodium. So anytime that I, um, that I am sauteing vegetables, I wanna make sure that I use either onions or mushrooms so I can get that umami flavor. Then like I said, I like to use garlic. Um, certain herbs like basil, thyme, those work out. 
Oregano is a great one. Um, if we're if we were looking into more ethnic spices, we can we can get, that's where we get into like the turmeric, the cardamom, cumin is a great one to add into southwestern flavors. Yeah, um, I love turmeric. I mean, it has kind of like a smoky thing almost going on, and it has some great health benefits it does. as well. So yeah, so think about those when you're uh, next time you want to use that that salt. Think about some of the suggestions that uh, chef has given us. All right, so. Um, Aside from your work in preparing healthy foods, how else are uh, the students in the Detroit Public Schools learning about uh, healthy eating? So we actually have our own farm and garden program. The, um, okay. the Detroit School Garden Collaborative is it's, it's run by Matt Hargis. We have a farm at, um, at Charles Drew Transition Center that we have eight hoop houses on now. We grow, um, so we grow in the hoop houses year round. We also grow in the, in, um, in the fields obviously during the growing season within Michigan. So right now is actually when they should probably be starting to get ready to, to do the planting in those. Um, we grow everything from corn to cantaloupes, sweet potatoes. Um, we grow raspberries, blueberries, celery, asparagus. The asparagus that came off last year was amazing. Okay. Um, all of that, to the extent that, that it can, goes into the school lunches. The issue that we've been running into in years past is that our harvest season or our, our, um, our growing season is right throughout the summer, right? So anything that's harvested during the summer, unless it is an extremely hearty vegetable like carrots, like um, corn, it's not really gonna hold. So a lot of the salad mix and the, and the fruit that we grow ends up going to the community, which in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. But what I would like to do is get it back into, um, back into the school mill. So we're gonna be changing our crop plan this year to grow hardier crops that we can then process and freeze for usage through the, through the months of um, September and October when school comes back into session. Well, that's exciting. You know, it's kind of rough, you know, being in a state like Michigan where it gets cold and everything. And um, I always hear the term like root vegetables because when you get into the winter, that's where the root vegetables are more available, right? Mm -hmm. And now tell me, I'm not quite sure I know exactly what a root vegetable is, but it seems <laughs> like people don't like the root vegetables as much as they, are they more bitter or what is it? What's up with the root vegetables? I, I'm a fan of root vegetables, so I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, examples of root vegetables, vegetables, excuse me, would be like carrots, parsnips, um, different, different squash, uh, what else, beets is a good one. There's actually a, a root vegetable blend that um, we get from our Broadline distributor that's a mixture of beets, squash, carrot, and potatoes. And when it's roasted, it's, it's amazing. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily know that it's an issue that people don't like the vegetables so much as they may not necessarily know what to do with them. What to do with them. And I, and I think I that that's, um, that that's a big thing. So to combat that, actually my chefs and I, we have, I have a group of four chefs working up under me. We, do, um, we started in, in conjunction with the FACE department, that's um, the Family and Community Engagement Department at DPSCD a program called Quarantine Cuisine where we would um, essentially do cooking shows from, from our schools and we talked about everything from um, Black History Month and, and, and Juneteenth recipes to holiday recipes to extensive talk about healthy eating and how we can use those fresh, ve fresh vegetables, excuse me, in different and creative ways. Well, that's wonderful. So now we're gonna end, if you could, um, just say one thing about how can we get people to value more and know the value and invest in nutrition and understand how important it is to like eat for health, understand that, you know, we are what we eat and that, you know, food we eat not only for enjoyment, but for health mm -hmm. and for healing and that things like this beautiful bowl of fruit, which hopefully you and I will get a chance to tear into soon, that these are the kinds of things that, you know, build healthy bodies. What suggestions uh, would you have for helping to move the needle to get people to invest and to appreciate that? Oh man, wow, that's, there's so many layers to the answer to that question. So on a personal level, it's, it, it goes back to that old saying, the apple a day, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah. I mean, realistically, we have to go to the doctor, but obviously, like you said, eating healthy, and that's, that's like the building block of a, of a healthy body and, and a healthy mind. We know that there's extensive research that shows that. I think moving on, looking at it from a societal standpoint, though, 
there is, I, that's kind of like where the disconnect com comes in, right? Because obviously, when we think about it from an equity standpoint, we know that society recognizes that that's a necessity because we have stores like Whole Foods, Joe's yes. Produce, where things like that are, you know, those, those farm fresh vegetables are, are readily sold. However, they aren't everywhere. And for some reason, those farm fresh vegetables and, and organically grown vegetables are gonna be more expensive than what you would find at the neighborhood store on the corner. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. I'm, I'm working with the Detroit Food Policy Council to, to come up with an answer for that, but it's not an answer that I have myself. It's just, it's something that I think needs to be in the forefront of all of our minds though, because like I said, it's, it's an equity issue. I believe we'll find it. Well, there you have it. March is National Nutrition Month. Make sure to eat your fruit and vegetables as you can. Remember an apple a day. You need to go to your doctor, but an apple a day will certainly help to keep you healthy and maybe just may keep that doctor away a little bit longer. Remember, knowledge is power. We'll see you next time.